Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, it is 3.02, so um, thank you everybody who has joined us. Um, I am Dr. Jenny Hay, and I'm the program manager for Scout SA, which is the survey and designation arm of San Antonio's Office of Historic Preservation. Um, thanks again for being here for this second installment of Scout SA's virtual classroom, which is called Discover the Story of Your Home. This is part of the Office of Historic Historic Preservation's 2020 Preservation Month calendar. Um, if you aren't already familiar with Preservation Month, it's an annual nationwide celebration held each May where we celebrate our city's built and cultural heritage. Typically, it involves a variety of in-person activities, but this year, OHB has moved um, pretty much everything uh, online so that we can celebrate safely. Today's presentation, as I mentioned, is part two of two. Um, last week, I spoke about the development history of San Antonio, and together we explored our legacy neighborhoods and some of the architectural styles that make them distinct. OHP has a number of other fun events happening this month, too, which you can read about at SAPreservationMonth.com, including a cemetery conservation webinar on May 23rd, as well as a program hosted by our city archaeologists on May 20th about some of San Antonio's most significant archaeological discoveries in the past year. There's a virtual edition of Donuts and DIY on May 18th that brings together local rehab professionals for an Ask an Expert style panel. That's, uh, uh, and additionally, Historic Run Crew has some challenges um, that are available online for those of you who miss running um, through our historic districts as part of that fun monthly series. If you're interested in joining us for these and other Preservation Month events, uh, check out that calendar at SAPreservationMonth.com and follow us on social media, which is at SAPreservation on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, just a few housekeeping notes for you here before we get started. Uh, to ensure that everyone can hear us throughout our presentation, we've muted attendees. Uh, but we still want you to participate, so please take advantage of the chat function that's on your screen. You can submit your questions at any time during the presentation, and our colleague Lauren will forward them to us. And we'll also have time for a Q&A session afterwards in case you prefer to hold your questions to the end. Um, so without further ado, uh, today Jessica Anderson and I want to share with you how you can discover the story of your home. So I'm going to turn it over to Jessica to get us started today. Let's see if I can hand her over our privileges here. All right. Jessica, I'm going to wait for your camera to come live, and then I'll turn mine on, okay? Excellent. Am I not there yet? Not quite. Okay, I can see you now. So, all right, thank you very much. Excellent. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica. Um, so, this afternoon, as Jenny mentioned, we're going to talk a bit about discovering the story of your house. Um, we're going to cover some research tools that are available online and um, what kind of information you'll find there. Um, a lot of these tools are also available at the public library, which of course we don't want to send you there until after it's safe. Um, but a lot of the resources are also available through SAPL or otherwise online. Um, we're also going to talk about what kind of information you'll find using these tools and also how our program and our office uses what we learn through these research tools to build narratives about properties and neighborhoods in San Antonio. And then we'll wrap out, up by um, talking about some ways that Scout SA in particular can help you learn more about your home through some assessment tools and designation options. And pardon me for looking back and forth. I have you guys on split screen between my notes and the slides. So, um, But before we jump into the tools, um, I wanted to share with you uh, a great resource, if you don't already know about it, that's available through the public library, which is the genealogy desk. Um, it's located in the Texana room on the top floor of the central library, but you can also reach them at the email listed there. Um, our library also provides card holders with a number of research tools available remotely so that you can research your property from home. But you have to have a library card uh, to log in and access these tools. So if you don't already have a library card, I highly recommend applying online. You can get immediate access to these tools by visiting mysapl.org, and you just have to search library card, and it'll bring you to the information about how to apply remotely. 
So um, my first step typically when I'm researching an address is to look for it on a Sanborn fire insurance map. Um, if you aren't familiar, these are detailed maps that were created so that fire insurance companies could assess the total liability in cities and urbanized areas. Um, and they provide a lot of great information to researchers about properties built in San Antonio prior to the mid 1950s. Um, these are the years that are available online for San Antonio, but you can also request maps from the 30s by emailing the library's genealogy desk. Um, I typically consult Sanborns first because they often include information about changes to street names and house numbers, which is something that's really common among San Antonio's historic neighborhoods. So for example, uh, let's look at 241 East French Place. This is a property that's in the process of becoming a local historic landmark. On the 1912 Sanborn Fire Insurance map, we can see the house was addressed 308 Indo. That's the map at the left. Um, but by 1951, the street name had changed to East French Place and the house number shifted to 241. So this is important information for our next research step, which is consulting city directories. Because if you looked up 241 East French Place in the 1912 city directory, there might not be anything listed, which could lead you to assume that the house wasn't built yet, which in this case is accurate. Um, I also wanted to point out on the 1951 map that it shows that the street name used to be called Indo. It's circled in green at the right side of your screen. So as you're looking through your maps, you can kind of look for clues within the map um, to help you, uh, you know, move forward in your research too. So maybe you saw the 1951 map first and you see that it used to be called Indo. So you know that prior to that map, you should probably looking, be looking for Indo and not for East French Place. If I go too fast at any point, please message us and let me know. Um, we're trying to cover a lot of information, so I recognize I may be speaking a little quickly. Um, so this is the same set of maps. Um, and they, I wanted to point out that they also provide really interesting information about changes to the footprint of the house. Um, so on the 1912 map, you can see the original footprint of the house, that kind of T-shape um, with, you know, the, the one section going to the right. Um, but by 1951, they added a small rear addition. So in this case, to kind of try to hone in on a more exact date for that edition, I might email the genealogy desk and ask for those 30 map, 30s maps just to see if it has uh, sort of more specific information about when that edition might have happened. Um, I also wanted to share, uh, I don't have an example of it here, but you might occasionally on Sanborn maps see build dates included, like on the footprint of the building. It'll say constructed 1952 or something similar. But in my experience, that has happened more with commercial structures than residential, but it's still something to keep an eye out for just in case. So standard maps that are available online through the public library, some will appear in black and white um, unless you request those 30s maps, which they scan from the color copies. Um, and the online maps, they provide a ton of really good information, but you can access the color maps as well for free through the Perry Castaneda Library at UT Austin. Um, the color maps are really interesting to look at because they show materials information. Uh, the sort of caveat is that you have to be sure you're looking at the key affiliated with that year and volume of maps because sometimes the keys change from uh, set of maps to set of maps. So here we're looking again at that 1912 map for 241 East French Place, which was formerly addressed 308 Indo. The key from the second volume of the 1912 maps, which is the set of maps that these belong to, shows that the house is constructed of brick and historically had either a composition or shing comp I'm sorry, composition shingle or gravel roof. And we can tell because the house is uh, filled in pink. And this is just a photo of 241 East French Place. I hate sharing information about these properties without you seeing what they look like. Um, and though this isn't a great photo, um, the house is actually constructed of brick. It's just been painted. So we can confirm that construction based on that color sandboard map. So after um, I consult the sandboard map, I typically take information found there and consult the city directories. Um, city directories are kind of like proto phone books. Um, they were developed to assist like door-to-door -door salesmen in cities mostly. 
Um, but in them, after 1901, you can search by both street name and by a residence name or a business name. Before that, it's listed by um, last name, by residence name or business name. And these directories are available online through the library, through the Heritage Quest function. And um, it's for the years 1877 through 1960. And that's not inclusive. There isn't a directory available for every year. Um, and a lot of them also cover multiple years. So it's listed as 1910, but it's actually covering 1910 to 1911. Um, and then just to note the Texana room on the top floor of the Central Library does have hard copies of these directories. Um, but again, we're trying not to send you guys there right now um, until they open, keep everybody safe. Um, so there's a bit of a trick to accessing what I think is the best way to use city directories online. So I'm gonna walk you through it a bit. Um, when you choose city directories from the options on Heritage Quest, this is the landing page you get. Um, you can search for information by like a residence name or an address or a keyword search like a business name, but I prefer to browse by year, which is only accessible by conducting some kind of search first. So usually when I get to this page, I just type in nonsense into the keyword search, and then I hit search, which takes me to something that looks like this results page. Um, at the left side of the screen at the bottom where I've circled, you see that it says browse individual records. And in this case, individual records means the individual city directories by year. And you click that triangle that's to the right of the phrase browse individual records. And this is the drop down menu that you see. So you choose Texas, you choose San Antonio, or if we have any out of towners joining us, whichever city and state you're looking at, and then the year of the directory that you want to look at. And then it generates a link at the very bottom um, and you click that link to access that year of city directory. And then once you are in a specific year of the city directory, you can more easily navigate year to year. Um, just by clicking the year, it's in the center top above the page of the city directory and you can drag down to any year that's included in the database. So, City directories, they have a ton of information in them. They're actually one of my favorite research tools just because um, there's so many contextual clues in them that you can find when you consult them. Um, but you kind of have to know the, the language of city directories. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can search either by the street name or by a residence name if you know one. Um, I'm gonna use 1622 West Huisach as an example. Um, this became an individual landmark last year, really beautiful little home. Um, we first searched it by the street name, and I found that in 1948, somebody named Richard N. White was, was listed as the owner. That's what that little circled O means next to his name. And if I then took that information and cross-referenced it in the section of the city directory where you look up by last name, and it provides a little bit more information. So we know that his wife's name was Bess. Um, that he either owns or works for are in White Company, I think the name makes us assume it's his business, and that his home, H in this case means home, is 1622 West Quee So it's really important, it's kind of a, a both and situation. Not only should you get the information from the street search, but you should also be using that to cross-reference information included in the search by last name. Do you have any questions so far? I feel like I'm flying through this. So, oh, I forgot to mention that uh, directories from the late 1800s, they didn't include listings by street. Um, so something else that's important to keep in mind is if you find a name later in the directory that's affiliated with the address, you can work backwards into those late 1800s directories um, to see if either they were still at that address or kind of trace it backwards into those directories where you can't access the information by street name. Jeff, I have a question. Okay. Uh -huh. What if, what if like the, the house is on the Sanborn, but it's not in the city directory? So we see that actually pretty often. Um, there, it's possible for uh, streets to be unnamed or for uh, houses to appear without house numbers. Um, and it, it's really sort of 
I think that's probably a situation again where we would work backwards is um, if, if you think that your house was built in say like 1935, um, you might want to start at a city directory around that year. But if you don't find anything immediately, you could be moving forward until you find an instance of that address. And then the information you find in that directory, just like with the 1800s directory, you can kind of use it to work as far backwards as possible um, until you hit sort of like the very last dead end. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Um, okay. No other questions that I see. Oh, sure, go ahead. I said no other questions that I oh, see. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, I, this is another sort of screen grab from a 1909 city directory from Ninth Street. And I chose this one because it was a really great example of other sort of coded items in city directories. Um, the H next to a name when you're looking at uh, the search by year in this instance means homeowner the same way that O met owner in the 48 directories. Um, so kind of like same with the, the keys for the Sanborn maps. Sometimes these codes are shift a little bit year to year with the city directories. Um, at the end of the lines where it says like four, four, six, that's the number of residents living in the house. That's something I always find really interesting. Um, especially when, you know, our office recently was looking at shotgun houses and you see an address for a shotgun house that's like 500 square feet that had eight residents. And it just sort of gives you a good idea of how um, attitudes about personal space have shifted over time. Um, the R in this case means the person was a renter. Um, we have an example here where someone is listed in the rear, which means sometimes it can be like a rear apartment in the same building or that it's an accessory dwelling on the property detached from the main house. Um, a really important thing that's included in earlier city directories is this C in parentheses, and that specifically means that the resident was a black person. Um, so that gives us really good context for neighborhoods where if you see that C next to a bunch of names, we know that this was a predominantly black neighborhood and that can help us build context and build eligibility criteria for that neighborhood. Um, and then next to 427, we see that it's listed as vacant, which is also really important because that denotes that the structure is there, but it's just that nobody was living at it. So if, if that was the first instance of an address, you still know that the address was there. It's just that it didn't have a resident of record. Um, so other information that you can kind of glean from city directories, if we go back to that search by last name, these are again the results for Mayor White. Um, we see that they can include information about employers, and that can sometimes help build a case for eligibility, um, kind of depending on, on, you know, what's listed there. We've used this a lot when we find that properties are, for example, um, used to house primarily people who worked for the railroad or perhaps owned by someone who owned a prominent business in the area. It just provides an additional layer of information about that resident. Um, and then I didn't include in examples some other codes that occasionally appear. Um, one that we see often is WID, and it's always included with a man's name. And that means that that woman listed is a widow of that man, um, unfortunately listed kind of like it's her occupation. Um, and occasionally also that will include a death date. I've seen that a few times also, a death date for that widow's deceased husband. Um, you can also sometimes see names of adult children living at the same address. Um, we also often see under construction, it appears under a C-O-N-S-T-R, and that's awesome for build date information because that's pretty much hard and fast, like you know that in 1910 to 1911 that house was under construction. Um, so really awesome when you find that. Um, we also occasionally see no response, and that means that the structure is there, they don't think it's vacant, but they couldn't uh, confirm who's living there at that time. Oh, I see from Sherry, she's asking eligibility for what? That's a great question. Um, I was talking to Jenny earlier and I realized that we talk about this stuff so often that we think it's clear that, you know, you all will know what we're talking about, but this is an instance where that's clearly not true. Um, so when we talk about eligibility, and we'll discuss this a bit more later, we're talking about building cases for whether or not these addresses are eligible for local historic designation. Um, we use a set of criteria, then I'll talk about it later. Um, and the research that we gather here helps us 
determine which of those criteria, if any, a property might um, be eligible under in city code. You're welcome. Okay, so after um, we sort of collect this information from the Sanborns and the city directories, I take names that I find there, addresses that I find there, and I plug them into, OHP uses newspaper archive, but there are other sources too. So um, newspaper archive is a subscription service. Um, it's available on site at um, any local library, but you can't access it um, off of a library computer um, or library network. Um, so newspaper archive, it has, it allows us to search papers, um, the Express News, the Light, La Prensa, um, the San Antonio Zeitung, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, it's the German language paper. Um, and even if you don't speak Spanish or German, um, we often see photos in these that can be helpful, um, you know, for collecting information about historic properties. So don't discount them, you know, if you see an image, it's worth looking through to see if it has anything useful for you. Um, SAPL online has Newspaper Source Plus available, which is very similar to newspaperarchive.com, um, and it's available under their databases. Um, the Express News Online, I find to be occasionally helpful, more, mostly for more recent history, um, but it's worth searching, um, you know, plugging in an address, plugging in a name, and see what you can come up with. Um, the Portal to Texas History, if you're familiar with it, um, has both Express News and San Antonio Register archives. Um, and then the Institute for Texan Cultures uh, through UTSA, they have the San Antonio Light photo collection. So if you see a photo um, and the search result in a newspaper from the light, they might have sort of a clearer copy of it available um, for you. Is this one the same newspaper that you get on Ancestry.com? You know, I am not sure. So newspaperarchive.com, um, for us, the way that we use it is independent of um, Heritage Quest and Ancestry.com. Jenny, do you know whether either of those services include newspaper archives? You know, I don't know because we use them separately. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, there are also some additional um, digitized newspaper archives I know that are available online, some of which have significantly older um, newspaper collections than, than newspaper archives. Because of uh, sort of the time period of San Antonio development, that one seems to be the best sort of snapshot of newspaper archives for us, so that's why we rely on it so heavily. But um, yeah, there are certainly other um, other resources out there, um, Ancestry being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Jenny. So let's dive into the kind of stuff you can find through newspaper research. Um, so uh, it's always a good day when we find a, an historic photo of a property because it can provide a lot of information about features that um, were there historically and whether they've been maintained or changed or you know modified in some way. Um, so this is a photo from March 1940 of 247 East Summit, which is in the Monte Vista um, local historic district. Um, I see a question I'm going to answer quickly. Heritage Quest is what you can access through um, the public library if you have the library card. Um, and we use it all the time. I mean, the city directories are so beneficial. Um, I highly recommend getting a library card so that you can access these databases. Um, so uh, 247 East Summit, we have this gorgeous uh, historic photo. This is actually um, a photo that includes Emma Kaler. You may recognize the name Kaler uh, related to Pearl Brewery. I think we determined in the end that this was actually Otto Kaler Jr. Um, so his, his father, I think, was the founder of the Pearl Brewery. Um, but this is sort of a, a funny advertisement where she's standing in front of this new Buick convertible um, and then the historic photo passes in the background. And you jump on Google Street View and you can see how little the property has changed over time. Um, one of my favorite things about this is you can actually see how much the trees have grown over time. Um, you can see the steps in the front yard. You can see that beautiful sort of like iron glass work at the, the top floor. Um, and you can really see how, how intact and how well-maintained this um, historic home is. Um, so 843 Rigsby um, became an individual landmark, I believe in 2018. Does that sound right, Jenny? It seems like it was like 2018. Um, and it's in Highland Park, and we found this photo through the course of our research for designation of that property. Um, 
in an advertisement for the Highland Park neighborhood. And this is a photo um, that was part of the case file for the designation. And something that um, we found particularly helpful about this is that the historic photo showed um, this pergola running from across that sort of recessed front porch all the way over the driveway. And that pergola is no longer here, only the piers remain. So it gave us a sort of like peek into the original configuration of the house that um, was just really interesting and, and um, adds a fun layer to the history of the house. Um, something else that's important to keep in mind um, is um, you can also find information, like good contextual information about your neighborhood, even if it doesn't include your address. So here we found this really cool, like three quarters page ad for Green Lawn Estates. It's from 1927. They're advertising um, lots for sale for development in the neighborhood. Um, and there's really good information that we found through this, uh, through this, this advertisement. So not only do, not only do we get that like nice, let me go back for a second. That nice rendering of the house in the top right corner. We get information about the development company, this Miller Darrow company, information about the boundaries of the states. It's listed West Avenue, Vance Jackson. They're on the very north. It's sort of difficult to read, but it says Fredericksburg Road. Really good contextual information. And then also has information about covenants that they say here are designed to protect investors from neighboring structures that would detract from the value of their property. And this is something that's like kind of coded language we see a lot in old advertisements. You also sometimes see it in deed research where, um, you know, a homeowner had to spend a certain amount of money on a property um, in order to be approved to construct in that neighborhood. So it's kind of like, to say it nicely, like trying to keep out the riffraff, I guess, is the, the kindest way I can say it. Um, so yeah, really good contextual information, not necessarily related to a specific address, but it gives us good information about um, sort of what was happening in the neighborhood around the time um, a house in Green Line Estates might have been built. And then last, even if we don't find a photo of a property or a really cool rendering like we did for Green Line Estates, you may find important information about who built a property like we did with 215 Lowell. Um, so this is one of our favorite cases. It actually came to us originally as a request for demolition. And when we shared with the owner that we had found all this information about the builder, he actually pulled the demolition permit and ended up um, requesting designation for the property. So it's a big W for Scout SA. We were really excited to get that designation. Um, but through, through our research, we learned that um, this fellow named Henry Schoenfeld uh, bought lots on Lowell Street from R.H. Hunsock, and um, that's that second clipping there. The first clipping, we learned that he started a trade school in San Antonio. And then the bottom clipping, we learned that uh, Shane Feld was injured while working. It says when a scaffold on which he was standing in Lowell Street gave way and he fell to the ground. Um, so these are all sort of like little clues that tell us, oh, well, it looks like, you know, Shanfield probably built this house. Um, and then continuing our research, um, a few days after the report of his fall, we have an obituary published. Um, and in the obituary, we learned that he was a German immigrant who worked in Austin before coming to San Antonio, and that he actually helped build the Driscoll and the State Capitol building up in Austin. And then the headline describes him as a well-known contractor. And because Shane Feld, so we know he owns these lots on which 215 and 217 both sit. Um, these articles kind of showed us that he was a regionally respected builder, that he likely built this property, and you can kind of see it to the left in the photo. Um, that red roof property is basically an exact match for 215 Mall, um, and we suspect that he and his son built both of these properties. Um, and that he died from injuries sustained while working on one of the properties. So all of this kind of helps us build a narrative about 215 Lowell um, and make a case for why it should be retained and respected as an historic property. Any questions? Oh. None over here. Um, somebody just wrote to post cool detective work. And I think that all of us who work on this stuff feel 
like detectives when you get to do this kind of work. So um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about before I sort of hand things back over to Jenny for a bit, um, it's a little macabre, but it's a website called findagrave.com. And it's really helpful for genealogy related items. Um, I use often to find or confirm family members related to a property. It also sometimes has links to obituaries or people can leave like little remembrances below people's names also. So just like really interesting information that is worth exploring, um, you know, while you're doing research on your house. Um, so I'm gonna use Mayor White as an example again, just because we know a lot about him. So we know his first name, his middle initial, his last name. Um, through our research, I know what year he died. Um, and then for the location of the cemetery that the person may be buried in, I always try Texas first. Um, we see a lot of folks who might have been prominent in San Antonio who end up being buried in like Floresville or Holotus or something like this. So um, having that sort of wider search um, ups the chances of you having a, a good uh, result. So Richard N. White, died in 1977, and we suspect he's buried in Texas. So when we search that, we get one record for Richard Nayland White. And clicking through that, it has a photo of, in this case, he's buried in a mausoleum, and it looks like he's buried with his wife and son. And um, it's really useful because you can confirm somebody's identity through the birth and death dates there, making sure that your really talking about this individual if you include them as part of the significance of a home. Um, it includes birth and death dates for his wife and son. It includes his wife's maiden name, which might help build like sort of further significance for the people who lived in this property. Um, sometimes you'll also see um, other extended family members like parents and siblings, and you can just like rabbit hole, click through all of those names and build cases for significance. Um, we see that a lot with, uh, you know, German settlers, people who um, immigrated here after the Mexican Revolution, that they have this sort of lineage that becomes more prominent as you click back through their parents and grandparents, and you can kind of build a cool story about how they arrived in San Antonio, how their families arrived in Texas. Um, so really good resource, um, really fun to poke through. And you can actually contribute to it too if you're interested. They um, allow people to upload photographs and uh, locations of graves and things like that if you're interested in that. Right. And I'm gonna pass host duties back over to Jenny to cover some fun map stuff. Great. All right, um, while we and just get resituated here, I will take a second to say that, um, you know, Jess has introduced some really valuable primary sources that we look at um, and we are very familiar with. And the more you use them and play around with them, um, the more comfortable you'll get with searching um, those uh, different databases. But um, the, uh, the important thing to me is that once you find um, a bit of information or something that sparks your interest, uh, it's really important to just kind of let yourself um, uh, explore that information, right? And uh, for some folks, looking at the Sanborn fire insurance maps are like the most interesting way to think about structures. You can see the footprint, you can see the materials, you can see the change in the street grid over time and the um, street numbering system. Um, for other people, uh, using find a grave and kind of coming at this from a genealogical perspective can be a really motivating way to think about researching a property. Um, and I think that that's, that's uh, uh, really, not only really interesting, but also really valid way of exploring how we relate to these historic spaces. Um, for me personally, I'm a geographer and uh, I think of things in sort of big picture uh, mapping sense. And so um, it's, uh, valuable for me to start from sort of this uh, a bird's eye view, if you will. And so uh, the uh, the map that I want to start um, my little bit of this presentation with um, is actually it's actually a collection of bird's eye view maps that were drawn in the late 19th century um, and are available in an interactive format through. Uh, the Carter Museum, uh, which is a, a Museum of American Art in Fort Worth. Um, these maps are particularly helpful, uh, obviously, if you are researching a structure that dates from this time, but also because they show the actual form of the house. And it's surprising how um, accurate 
uh, the depictions of the houses are. So you can get a really good feel for a structure, even if it wasn't necessarily included on in one of those Sanborn fire insurance maps, because the coverage of these um, bird's eye views is actually a little bit larger than the Sanborn maps were during this time period. Um, and you can get a really good feel for um, the, the sort of way the house uh, sat on the site, whether it was close to um, a body of water, whether that was the river or a creek or an acequia. Um, uh, you can also uh, see pretty clearly change over time as you look through these maps. Um, uh, between 1873, 1886, and 1891. So um, that's a really great um, resource. I would also say that uh, um, like a lot of the resources that we're talking about today, they tend to be most helpful for structures that are located sort of in that historic core of the city center. Of course, there were residential neighborhoods that were forming um, sort of spreading uh, uh, in a sort of radial direction out from that city center during this time period. but. Um, if you are looking for a more rural uh, property, it is possible that they were included on these maps because there was a strong relationship of that farmland or hinterland with um, the, the city center. And so um, it is possible that you could find um, farmhouses uh, or other similar structures um, on these. Don't give up hope um, if, if it's not something in the downtown area. All right. Uh, more on the historic map front, there are a number of early 20th century street maps that we find very useful. Um, there's a 1909 map of San Antonio, and uh, you can access it actually just by Googling 1909 San Antonio street map. Um, we also have uh, um, included in the documents for this presentation, and we'll also follow up with an email uh, links to where some of these maps are saved um, online so that you can see um, uh, what's available. Uh, the, one of the biggest, I think, advantages of looking at maps like this, um, not only is it, it gives you that context again of the growth of the city and you can understand kind of how, um, uh, how your home fits in in that broader story, um, but also uh, several of them, including a really great one from 1924 that we actually featured in our last presentation, um, they have the names of the neighborhoods that were platted and subdivided uh, during this time period. And so if you are interested in finding um, information about uh, sort of when your neighborhood sort of came to life, this is a really great way um, to, uh, to start that particular bit of this exploration. So taking that neighborhood name, um, you can find using uh, the uh, Bear County um, records, and we'll cover those in just a second, um, you can find uh, plaques uh, for the neighborhood that you live in. All right, a couple more maps. These are a little bit more um, uh, San Antonio specific, obviously. So uh, the city of San Antonio has a couple of different uh, GIS products that might be helpful, might not. Um, the, uh, what we call the one-stop map is our development services map, and that contains zoning information, both of the base zoning and also um, uh, design overlay. So if you're uh, within a historic district or the river improvement overlay, you can find that information here um, on the one-stop map. You can also find information about what neighborhood association a property is in and then what city council district a property is in. Um, all just good things to know uh, how to access. Um, and coming soon, uh, we actually have a new GIS product that we've been working on um, uh, diligently for a number of years here, uh, the Explorer map. Um, this, uh, you should follow us on social media because we're going to have a big announcement about this pretty soon. Uh, and you can quickly search uh, historic properties for recent permits and what we call certificates of appropriateness. So if your property is already located in a historic district or maybe is already an individual landmark, this is a way that you can use a map to access uh, previous approvals for work that was that were, uh, was completed on a property um, and uh, could provide some information about, um, uh, again, previous cases. Uh, you could see changes that might have been made, um, additions that could have been made, uh, removals of materials that might have happened um, uh, related to those properties. Uh, the other, I think, really great um, resource that the Explorer map is going to provide for, for folks is access to our historic survey data. Um, so uh, Scout SA has been surveying um, 
uh, really since the 1970s, the city of San Antonio. And so we've been working hard to digitize a lot of that. So far, we've gotten back to about 2004. And so this map will actually make those survey results available to you um, through, uh, through just a single click. You won't have to email us and ask us to scan it. So it's a pretty exciting um, Before we move on to your interesting question, someone asked if anyone has geo-referenced any of the Sanborn maps, and if so, if that information <laughs> is public. Um, so the short answer in San Antonio is no, they haven't been geo-referenced. It's a, a great question. Um, I do know that uh, there is a GIS specialist at Bear County who has worked to um, geo-reference one of the late 1800s, I think is one of the 1880s editions, um, but that is not publicly available because those are um, copyrighted, uh, the Sanborn Fire Insurance maps that are held through um, the, the library system that we access um, are actually protected under copyright, so it's not something that we can share via one of our um, map layers. Uh, that's not the case for all of the editions of Sanborns, and it's not the case for all of the cities that Sanborns were um, made for. So um, other cities have uh, been able to do that and share them publicly. We, we're just not one of those. So um, yeah, that's a great question. We all wish that that were available to us. Um, we have a, a brief follow-up question yeah, too yeah. Um, for the non-geographers. Can you briefly explain what georeferencing is? So oh, yeah, georeferencing is where you take um, an, uh, a map that's an image, uh, or really any kind of image, but in this case, a map, and then you um, basically tie that image down to um, a map digitally so that it sort of um, uh, folds over the globe correctly and falls down to you can kind of uh, um, navigate it just like just like you would navigate Google Maps, right? Um, it's just a historic image so that you're seeing it spatially referenced um, uh, correctly to uh, sort of a, a you know, ground level um, map. I hope that was a good explanation. <laughs> So like for people who haven't used Sanborns before, they're all literally hand drawn. And even though they're like mm, generally an accurate representation, like they don't really have the same accuracy of a lot of the like GIS based stuff we see today too. So it'd be an interesting exercise. I think that's a really cool question. Oh yes. Um, Lauren and I have received some special training to learn how to do that. Um, so it's a really fun thing to do. So. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's jump into historic aerial. So um, historic aerial photography is available for free at historicaerials.com. So it's not, uh, not hard to find and easy to navigate. I'll show you some screenshots in just a second of what you can kind of look at there. In San Antonio, um, these are the years that we have available. So the earliest historic aerial that's available through um, uh, this service is 1955. Um, these are helpful for uh, kind of big picture questions, determining dates of big modifications because the, um, the quality is not going to be fantastic, obviously, um, and uh, changes to the neighborhood. So you can kind of see the city grow and expand between 1955 and 2016 if you sort of look at uh, a progression of the historic aerial photographs. Um, they kind of pick up where Sanborns leave off, which is about you know the early 1950s. So they kind of um, join together, can um, help you uh, carry on that narrative, um, looking at how the footprint changes over time. Um, let's see, on to some of the screenshots here. So um, here's an example of an area where uh, it would be very useful to um, take a look at, uh, at historic aerials. So um, the Westside Creek system is an area that has seen um, some dramatic changes related to um, Army Corps of Engineers flood mitigation efforts over the years, especially between the 1950s and the 1970s. Um, here you are looking at an aerial uh, from 1955. Uh, and you can see sort of where these two creeks come together. I think this is Alazon and Apache Creeks, the, the Y there, um, sort of on the near west side of San Antonio. And um, if you uh, look at the same image, the same location by 1973, you can see that um, there's, uh, first of all, a large portion of sort of concrete culvert that's been um, introduced here. I'll kind of highlight that for you. Um, and 
uh, the, the sort of northeast corner of this image. Um, but you can also tell that there's been a number of structures removed. So um, if you were uh, uh, living along the creek, you were obviously at high risk of um, uh, flash flooding. And uh, there were a number of blocks that were just um, uh, removed during this time period. Um, and so if, if you sort of run into a dead end or if you're looking for a house and you don't understand why, and why it's no longer there, this um, could sort of answer those questions for you in a really direct way. Um, one more thing that I want to mention in maps, and we don't have um, a, a specific example for you here, but if we're looking um, outside of San Antonio, outside of the sort of historic core of San Antonio, um, sometimes what can be really helpful are uh, what are called topographic maps. And the U.S. Geological Service Survey, rather, um, is the organization that provides those. Um, there, there are some great historic editions. Uh, 1904, I think, is one of the earliest. Um, and if you're, again, if you're looking at sort of that outer, um, uh, outer portion of Bear County or in, in uh, um, uh, other sort of remote or rural locations, uh, you can um, establish whether or not a structure was there uh, a lot earlier than um, you could using some of our other resources. So, um, uh, again, th all of these things are very easy to Google, USGS topo, uh, and um, you can include the word historic, and that will link you to uh, their interactive um, uh, map service, which will allow you to see um, overlays of all of the map products that they have available online, and all of those are geo-referenced. So if you did want to um, uh, download those and use those in your own um, uh, uh, GIS or um, in any other way, they are available in a geo-referenced format. All right. And then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, uh, deed research that you can do through the Bear County Clerk. And I'm not going to go in too in-depth here because this is sort of the, the highest level um, work. And I will say that sometimes it can be the most frustrating because um, there's, uh, you can just spend hours searching for um, deeds moving back farther and farther in time. And of course, you get back far enough and some of them are in Spanish, which is a very exciting moment. Um, but the Bear County Clerk has uh, their entire um, collection digitized. So you can search for them online. Um, for free, you can download all of them for free. You do have to create an account, but um, it's really a very straightforward system. You could find, if you were searching, uh, the names of the first owners of a property, um, uh, or perhaps uh, even who built the property or an architect. Sometimes you can find um, a mechanics lien that would name the builder and or the architect. Um, uh, again, I mentioned that uh, you can use those um, street maps to establish the neighborhood names, and this is the place where you would use those neighborhood names to, uh, to try to find the subdivisions. Um, and, and those um, plats will list the name of the developer who subdivided the land. Sometimes it's the person who owns, let's say, the, the farm that used to be there, and sometimes it's the developer who purchased the property um, later. But those can, again, answer questions about the history of um, of your home or the, uh, the neighborhood around it. Um, if you don't know where to start here, uh, you can actually use the appraisal district's website to get started. Um, each uh, property record, um, you know, most property records have listed um, at least one uh, decent, uh, rather recent transaction um, that has a reference to those um, property files that the Bear County Clerk um, holds. And so you could use that information from the Appraisal District's website to sort of kickstart your deed um, research um, at the Bear County Clerk's website. Yeah. All right, and the last thing I wanna tell you is that you should never be afraid to just Google it. Um, you can find um, articles about San Antonio, about the history of San Antonio, about people in San Antonio that were written in other cities, other states, and other countries that could um, provide 
very interesting information for, um, for your research project. There are some wonderful um, family-specific genealogy websites that are out there. Um, and I, those of you who are experts at genealogical research will know that um, sometimes just putting in a name and seeing where it takes you is a really great way to, um, to find things that you just didn't even know were out there. There are um, some, also some really great resources that, um, that can help you if you have a name or uh, um, an idea of uh, a subject matter that might be related um, to your property. So um, we've already mentioned the portal to Texas history. This is at the University of North Texas in Denton. So they have this wonderful digital resource that not only has newspaper archives um, available in it, but also has a number of other really wonderful collections um, if uh, you're researching a property that might have been affected by urban renewal in San Antonio, they have a ton of photos of structures that were um, demolished as part of urban renewal um, on the west side of town, um, as well as within the um, uh, area that we now know as Hemisphere uh, related to the World's Fair. In San Antonio specifically, again, uh, the Institute of Texan Cultures has a wonderful digital archive that's at, located at digital.utsa.edu, and it is um, full not only of the San Antonio Light Photograph Collection, but also of some really wonderful documents, including a, a pretty extensive oral history collection that might be um, helpful as you are trying to research um, people who are uh, involved in the development of, of San Antonio and related to the property that you're researching. Um, and then um, just a quick note about historic methods. So um, when you are trying to research a property, we always try to triangulate data. So triangulation is a really silly way of saying we try to find the three sources to verify the information that we're looking for. And so um, that's why it's important to sort of cross check things like the city directories, things like um, the uh, find a grave where you can um, verify that you're talking about the right person who was born and died at the right time. Um, you know, names can always be confusing, spellings can be confusing, so it's always helpful to use um, to use those resources. And again, our, our goal is to find, uh, to try to find three things that really help us uh, um, verify that we're looking at the right person, the right place, the right house at the right time. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jess to sort of bring us home in the last six minutes. Excellent. I'm going to fly through this so that <laughs> we have a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. Um, oh, so there's a, a question really quickly um, about the Sanborn maps, and it says, how can we tell what year they're from? Um, the commenter said, I know they were hand-drawn, and sometimes they would recycle the map and draw over the old one. Um, so Sanborn maps, if you ever see them in, or have the opportunity to see that in person, highly recommend it. They actually literally, like, pasted bits of paper over the old footprints that there were changes. Um, and sort of the rule of thumb with Sanborns, especially the later ones, um, for example, the 1911 to 1951 or 1952 maps, um, you can really only cite that information to the most recent year listed. Um, so if you are looking at that 1911 to 1912 or like the republished maps, you really can only confirm that to 1952. Um, with the 1911 to 1951 maps, those include some sort of like interstitial maps from 1912 and 1924. And in those situations, if I think that that map is from one of those years, I cross-reference it with that Perry Castaneda site that has the color Sanborns, because that actually has them listed by 1912 and by 1924. So you know that the map you're looking at is from that year. You can confirm that it's from that year. And that's kind of my rule of thumb, is that um, you want it's better to sort of have a conservative estimate of that than to overestimate how old a property is. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, something uh, that's really important to me when I talk to people about um, researching their home, um, it's a little bit of um, managing expectations. So these tools are really helpful in fun cases. We can trace, um, you know, residents back. Uh, to when the house was built. We can find deeds that trace it through every person who's ever owned that property, but that doesn't happen in every case. Um, so these tools, they can't always help us determine an exact year of construction. Um, if you see a lot of our assessments or our cases for designation, you'll see us use that sort of Weasley circa before a year, um, and that's because that was the earliest year we could um, confirm that the, the address existed. Um, you're not always going to find an architect or a builder. Um, you're not always going to find the first resident 
and um, if it's a, a home that was built for a specific person, that information might not be available either. Um, and there's a number of factors that impact this. Um, one of the factors is when is the, was the home built. Um, earlier houses, it's a little harder to find records of it. Um, if it was outside of city limits, Jenny kind of mentioned this with the maps earlier, um, it's a little more difficult, especially of course within Bear County, to find records for something that was constructed when that part of the city wasn't included in Bear County or in San Antonio. Um, who the house was built for. Um, so if we look earlier at our examples, like that sort of beautiful two-story house in Monte Vista that was built for the Kalers, um, we're a lot more likely to find information about that because it was built for a prominent person in a prominent neighborhood in the city um, than if the house was sort of more vernacular, which is a word that really just means it was built um, using like local supplies and sort of, you know, more, more like builder designed house, contractor designed house, as opposed to something that was um, sort of higher style, we might say. Um, and uh, if there was an, a prominent architect or builder of record, it's more likely to be covered in things like the newspapers or in, or in uh, deed research, stuff like that. So there's kind of these different factors um, related to whether or not you will find um, just really like granular information about your property. Um, so Scout SA uses these research tools in a number of ways. Um, one of the main ones is to build cases for designation. Um, we work with owners who want to designate their properties and also with neighborhoods that want to become local historic districts. And these are all the same research tools that we use to, to create those cases for eligibility for designation. Um, our office, Jenny and I are, and then like half of another employee, are solely responsible for reviewing all demolitions in the city of San Antonio. And so if we come across a property that we think um, should not be, de not be demolished, we use these tools to build a case against demolition for that property. And the way we do that is if the property meets eligibility criteria, we can kind of work with the owner to explore alternatives to demolition for that property. Um, and then we also complete historic assessments, and then another assessment type is called a review of contributing status. That latter one is for properties that are included in local historic districts. Um, and again, it's just all about evaluating the property for eligibility under these UDC criteria. So um, when I say criteria, the city of San Antonio has 16 criteria for designation for individual landmarks and for local um, historic districts. And they're all listed, um, if you Google Municode, M-U-N-I-C-O-D-E, San Antonio, you'll get the website and you can search this uh, section, it's 35-607, um, and that is the city code that we use to determine these eligibility um, criteria. So, so, like I said, there are 16, and we kind of like to talk to them about like eligibility buckets. Um, it's uh, affiliation with a prominent person, whether that's a resident, an architect, um, you know, whatever the case may be, affiliation with a prominent event. Um, we've had cases where the resident was um, the first president of the Fiesta Commission, um, things like this, um, architectural style or construction methods, uh, relationship to other properties nearby, especially important when looking at local historic districts or eligible local historic districts. Um, and then cultural significance of a property as well as archaeological significance. Um, and these criteria are based on the Secretary of the Interior standards um, for listing as a landmark on the National Register of Historic Places, but they're kind of written through the lens of, of local San Antonio history. Um, we also use these research tools and the products that result in them to support our design review team. Um, so the reports build our office's knowledge of neighborhood histories, and it also lays the groundwork for our design review team to review um, requested scopes of work that owners submit for their individual landmarks or for their homes that are located inside local historic districts. Um, and as an example, we can, these reports can help design review, evaluate whether the request from the owner is impacting um, historic materials or the original footprint of the property versus a later addition or more modern materials. Um, so Scott SA can also help you research your property if it's not something that you have the bandwidth to do on your own. Um, 
the, there is no cost affiliated with designating your house as an individual local landmark. And um, by submitting that application, we really build this case for you. So we ask you for photos of your house. We ask you for a statement of um, how you think your house meets criteria. But then we kind of take that information and use these tools to build a really solid case for designation of your property. Um, your, the property just has to be 25 years old or older. And if that's something that you're interested in, you can give us a call and we'll talk you through uh, whether or not your property is eligible. It probably is. Um, you can also request whatever records we have on file for your address. Um, and that's something that is also free to you. Um, you can either do that through an open records request or give us a call and see what we have on file. Um, if your property is outside of a local historic district or um, was designated maybe back in the 80s or 90s, you may not necessarily have a ton of information on file about it, but we are happy to share with you whatever we do have. And then the last option is called an historic assessment, um, and that does come with a fee. It's a $350 fee per address, but we write a comprehensive narrative that is sort of a summary of all the research that we find about your property. And then we also provide all of the supplemental documents. So all of those like original research resources, um, we give you copies of those as part of that assessment. Um, and that doesn't result in a designation. It's um, just kind of uh, information about how we might treat your property if you request a designation for it. Um, we'll do a brief Q&A. We are already over four o'clock, um, but if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the chat. Lauren, do you got anything over there? All right. This is a good crowd. All right, so we are um, then gonna wrap it up since it's a little bit after four o'clock. So I will um, thank everybody for being here. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks to all of our attendees and their great questions. Um, we really appreciate you and uh, we hope that this was valuable for you. We will share the slides in um, the upcoming days. Uh, and uh, we've also recorded this uh, successfully, so we'll be able to share that as well. Um, for those of you who attended the last um, presentation last week, uh, we uh, were able eventually to get a recording of that presentation, so we will share that. Um, I know several of you have emailed me about it, so we'll get that up too. Um, if you have questions uh, about anything that you heard today, you can email us at ohp at sanantonio.gov. You can also call us. We are um, happy to help you through uh, any of this. Um, and as I mentioned, those links um, will also uh, will also include with the um, with those slides the links to all of the resources that we talked about today. Um, uh, we have a whole bunch of other events coming up uh, for the last few weeks of May, so I hope you'll join OHP for the other Preservation Month events that we have planned. Um, the full calendar, which is still growing as we move through this month, is available at essaypreservationmonth.com. And be sure and keep following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our handle is at essaypreservation on all of those channels, where we'll announce new events and remind you about upcoming virtual presentations, as well as our historic run crew challenges. All right, thank you again. Mm-hmm.